Thank okay, you. Uh, Chairman Young. Here. Uh, Vice Chair Bartlett. Here. Director Beal. Here. Director Ferguson. Present. Director Crane. Here. Director Martinez. Director Murphy. Here. Director Nelson. Director Puckett. Here. Director Rass. Here. Director Schoffel. Director Shea. Yes. Uh, Director Spitzer. Here. Here. Director Voigt. Here. Director Ward. Here. Brian Chamberlain. Here. Yeah, quorum. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Next on the agenda is a special recognition. If you will recognize the fact that we already recognized our special recognition, and we are most grateful for <laughs> Sam and all the work that he has done. Um, if, because the previous board was uh, polite enough, courtesy enough to extend their meeting, the rest of us got to enjoy that at that time. So I'm glad we were able to do so. I would like just like to add that I didn't recognize him. Would you recognize him, please? Well, no, I, I mean, I didn't recognize him with these oh. <laughs> So the, the unrecognized is now recognized. Yes. With that, public comments. This is the time for members of the public to address the Board of Directors regarding any items within the subject matter jurisdiction. Do we have any? There are none. No public comments. With that, we are moving to the consent calendar. Directors, are there any items you wish to pull? Move the calendar. Second. We have a motion by Director Puckett and a second by Director Kring. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That matter carries. All right, we are moving now to item number 12, the transponder procurement. And directors, if you did not have a chance to see this in the last meeting, just to bring you up to speed, uh, that item, which is reciprocal, was pushed, and so it will be brought back next month. Uh, there was a robust conversation that occurred with the first meeting with the San Joaquin Hills, but uh, if I may, why don't we delay that until next month when it's brought back for additional conversation, unless there are any questions that directors have. Move to continue the item. All right, thank you, Director. A motion by Mr. Director Murphy, and I think Director Second. Kring. Oh, you weren't quick enough, Director Boyce, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lucille beat you to the punch, so the second by Director Kring. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. All right, thank you very much. Moving to item number 13, the big data uh, analytics. Are we continuing with this one? Mr. Kramen, uh, do you want to introduce, or is it, it, it is continued. That, that was a nod that is continued. All right, this one also is going to be continued. Uh, if we continue on this trajectory, this will be a very short meeting. And so, but let me accept a motion, please, just to continue this as staff. Make a motion to continue. There you go, Mr. Boyd, you've gotten okay. that. And a second by Director Puckett, so all in favor say aye. 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 Very good, any opposed? That is item number 13. Item number 14, the investment advisor presentation. Mr. Martin, welcome. Sorry. Well, we're not through yet, so <laughs> I, I listened to Mr. Martin's presentation earlier. This could go for a very, very long time. Well, so so as you had uh, indicated that uh, Chandler Asset Management, who's here today with us, had uh, previously uh, presented information on the San Joaquin Board and uh, about our portfolios. And so the question before you is whether you want to go through the entire presentation, which is not overly lengthy, about uh, 10 minutes, or just to review the performance of the portfolios of the Foothill Eastern? Uh, they were most brief. Why, why don't you give us a quick overview of the crystal ball of what you see happening uh, next week and beyond, and then we'll go right into the portfolio analysis. Okay, so so with us here today is Chandler Asset Management, uh, Scott Prickett, who's a Senior Vice President, Portfolio Strategist, and Jason Schmidt, Senior Vice President, Portfolio Manager, and they will go over um, uh, the investment strategy, the characteristics of the portfolios, the performance of the portfolios as of June 30th, 2015. So please welcome Chandler. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Directors, so I, again, I'll keep it brief as I, I did this morning and uh, encompass really the factors that I'm looking at right here, the FOMC, labor markets, inflation and uh, economic growth into a discussion of the Fed, I think is the best approach to, to keep it brief because all of those factors are supremely important for the Fed and their decision making whether or not they move rates next, uh, actually next week or uh, next month in October and then the next meeting uh, before year end is in, is in December. Our expectation, and if you want to move to page six, please, our expectation is for the Fed to move in one of those three, three meetings. Uh, right now, as I stated earlier, the uh, the marketplace is really bifurcate, re uh, bifurcated relative to the assessment of whether or not they're going to move next week. 
Um, and again, whether or not they move or not, the decision making we make on behalf of your portfolios is, is consistent and disciplined. We do think we're on the edge of a rising interest rate environment, but nonetheless, we've uh, made recommendations and have strategies to encompass that expectation. Um, and also, as I, I stated this morning, the, the current Fed fund futures expects a 28, or there's, it's showing a 28% probability of a Fed rate move next week. And uh, the two most important factors for the Fed are, are the labor markets and uh, inflation. Their inflation target currently is 2%. One interesting uh, data point is right now we're sitting on more, this was, uh, uh, this data was uh, released just a week ago by the U.S. Uh, Department of Labor that we have more job openings right now nationally, 5.8 million, than at any point in history. So we've got a, a situation right now in the labor market that is a green light for the Fed to move at a headline number of 5.1%. However, we're still seeing benign uh, numbers on the inflation front and with the unknowns relative to the global factors, including the strength of the dollar and what that does to exports. Those are some uh, questions that certainly the Fed's going to be discussing next week as well as uh, the rest of the year. And uh, with that, if there's any questions on the economy and our outlook, I'd be happy to address that. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to uh, Jason to s discuss the characteristics and the performance. Okay, how about we see Jason? Thank you. Sure. So 28% probability, 72% improbability, quarter full, three quarters empty. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me uh, out today to, to, to talk about your portfolio. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to talk about is uh, as we came on as your investment advisor, one of the things we did was develop strategies uh, for TCA and for Foothill Eastern. And when we're looking at those, really what we're looking at is really providing liquidity for the portfolio. If you think about it, there's lots of sources and uses of funds and they're in different accounts and things like that. So really providing a strategy for that. Uh, the other thing looking at is really transitioning the portfolios to kind of more of an actively managed uh, uh, focus and looking at uh, really having a disciplined approach as Scott spoke about earlier. Also looking for a, a strategy in which we can maybe transition to a longer term strategy. Uh, we are not going to be in this interest rate environment that we are today forever. It's going to change. That is something that is a constant in the financial marketplace is change. And so looking for strategies that we can that uh, we can use today and then maybe may be able to transition to those longer term strategies in the future. And then of course always balancing that, that risk and return aspect relative to your investment policy, also the other uh, governing uh, documents along with relative to what's going on in the interest rate environment today. Uh, forward, next slide. Uh, uh, looking at the Foothill Eastern uh, and looking at uh, just uh, how we have looked at developing the accounts, we really have five categories here, actually four categories, I should say. Uh, the first one is some unrestricted reserves. So what this is is really a table that shows the different categories, shows the, the dates of those holdings. I'm not going to go through this right now, but also some characteristics, average maturity, average duration, average book yield, average market yield, and then, of course, the market value of those particular uh, investments. And so the first are the uh, unrestricted. So those are cash flow constrained, i.e. we're looking at uh, investing uh, the, those two certain cash flows, but also looking outside of those cash flows for those excess funds and looking out the yield curve to take it into account some of the uh, advantages that are out there. And you can see the characteristics of that portfolio. The next set of portfolios are really debt service. So these are contractual obligations that you have to make a debt service payment. Uh, so we look at investments that really uh, will have those uh, maturity dates to satisfy uh, those debt service payments and looking for opportunities where they're available to do so. Uh, the other indentured reserves, this is where we're managing these to a longer term strategy. And so we have the limited maturity strategy, I'll go over that a little bit later under the performance section. Um, but this is where we're looking for opportunities a little bit further out the yield curve, but also taking into account uh, some of the other factors that are out there. Then we have the enterprise funds. Uh, so enterprise funds, really, this is all the revenues and things that are coming in. Uh, and uh, what happens is they're deposited into accounts. Those are invested in money market funds. And then upon certain triggers and things like that, those funds are distributed out. Then we make investments decisions based upon that. Uh, we also use this just for consistency of reporting so that when you're looking at all the different funds that you'll have these in there. And then moving forward, looking at some of the performance characteristics. 
so looking at, at the performance characteristics, and we're going to look at the unrestricted reserves first of all, and I'm going to go over this table a little bit more in detail. Uh, what you can see there is really the, the portfolio name, and then what you have is the average market yield. This is the yield of maturity based upon the market price. So this is today's yield, really it's as of 6.30, which was the time that we looked at that. Uh, the average duration, so that's the, your portfolio sensitivity to interest rates. Uh, so this is a t statistic that the greater or the larger that number, the more sensitive it is to interest rate movements versus that of a, a smaller number, which it wouldn't be as uh, sensitive to interest rate movements. Uh, the next line after that is really the three-month total return. In this case, it's, it's looking at not only the realized but also the unrealized gain losses along with any income that's earned on the portfolio. This is consistent with your own mutual funds. Everybody talks about what's been the return on the S&P 500. They're quoting the total rate of return when they do that, so it's a consistency. Uh, so you can see over the last three months there, it was about nine basis points. Uh, the, since inception total return, you can see on the next column over, it was uh, as of January 31st, 2015, when we started to measure performance. Uh, that was 16 basis points, and you can see those funds have about almost $184 million. Then moving down to the next column, so you can see the debt, the debt service portfolios. And so you can see the average yield there, it's 15 basis points. Notice how it's uh, much smaller than that of the portfolios above. And if you look at the average maturity and the average duration of those port this portfolio, it's also much shorter because of debt service payments. And that we have a contractual obligation to make those payments. You can see the average duration of this is 0.38. We're using a benchmark, the Bank of America Merrill Lynch, to measure it against. Uh, which is the three to six month U.S. Treasury index. If you think about it, typically your debt service payments are usually within that period of time, so it makes it a representative example. The average uh, total return there is four basis points over the last three months versus the benchmark, which is three basis points since inception is 10 basis points of the portfolio versus four basis points of the benchmark, and the inception date there was February. Those represent almost $90 million of the funds. And then we have the uh, other indentured reserves or the, the, the strategy portfolios, the portfolios that we've been moving up to strategy. Uh, if you were in the other uh, uh, presentation, you saw that uh, the San Joaquin Hills portfolio was not brought up to speed yet. We were working with legal and staff as far as some of the intricacies as far as the bond indenture. These we did not have these same sort of constraints, so we're able to bring these up to the overall uh, strategy. Uh, so what you can see there is the average market yield at that time was 61 basis points versus the benchmark of 60. The average duration is 1.73 versus 1.8 of the benchmark. Three month total return 13 basis points versus 14 basis points of the benchmark. And then since inception, 32 basis points versus eight basis points. And that also has a February start date. And then you can see there on the, on the next section is the enterprise funds, which are about 10.4 million. So that brings you to a total of about $524 million. And I can answer any questions you may have on this. Directors, any questions? <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> do, do the same thing in English, please. <laughs> no, there was a good question I thought last time that uh, you answered well. The, the question was, tell us about CalPERS and their seven and a quarter, seven and a half percent target right. that they uh, so far have not been able to achieve this year. But uh, tell us what what box you're painted into. We're painting to a very different box. So where they may have a mosaic approach, we have a very black and white approach in the sense that we can only buy fixed income securities and a lot of times only government securities are very high quality uh, corporate securities, uh, typically with a maximum maturity of five years. If you think about CalPERS, they can buy anything from equities to commodities to trading strategies and things like that. So of course their box is much, much wider, um, but also you can see the volatility that occurs. And one of the things I'd want to bring a good point up, uh, just if you think about it, there's been a lot of volatility in the financial markets. But if you think about it, where's most of that volatility been? Overseas and also in the equity markets. This did not affect your portfolio's value. So actually when there's volatility in the marketplace, typically this portfolio has a stable value or actually its value goes up because yields come down and the prices of your securities actually increase during that period of time. Yeah, one more question I'll have. Uh, looking at your benchmark of the Bank of America Merrill Lynch on your other indentured reserves, just yes. so we highlight what we're seeing, make sure I'm seeing it right. You achieved 32 basis points uh, since inception versus 38, so you effectively losses six basis points plus your management fee. So you're here to tell us that you're going to beat that by the end of the year or at least in the long term, right? 
And if I, if I, would you wouldn't mind, let me rephrase that a little bit. Good, please. Is that we underperformed the benchmark. So I don't think that we lost money for you in the sense that in, you earned 32 basis points over that period of time. We did underperform during that period of time. Also, we're bringing the portfolios up to speed during that period of time. So yes, there was a little bit of movement that goes on there. But definitely in the future, we believe that the portfolio is going to be at least consistent with or actually a little bit above that of the benchmark. Also, for an for a, a annualized number, I would point you back to the average yield of a Maturity, which is about 61 basis points. So if you think about it, there's no changes in, in the market value of the securities, you should at least be earning that 61 basis points. If we were to see higher rates in the future on a total return basis, we might have short-term variances there, but also that will increase in the future at the same time. Yeah, I remember that when I go home to my wife and bring her a smaller paycheck, but I didn't uh, lose her money, I just <laughs> underperformed slightly. <laughs> right. Right. Director, as long as there's flowers. Directors, any other questions? All right, I believe this is a receipt and file. Thank you very much. We Thank appreciate you. it. All right, that takes us to the Chief Executive Officer's report. Mr. Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the Foothill Eastern Corridor Agency for the month of July, I'm happy to report that transactions were up 9.6% and revenues for the agency for the roads were up 11.6%. So that's our best month of the year, a great, great month for the road. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce a new staff member here. Mike Chesney joined us in mid-October as our Chief Strategic Planning Officer, so I'm sure you'll all get to know Mike, and some have seen him in committees, but first time board meeting for Mike. We're pleased to have him and, and looking for uh, a lot of great things from Mike. The agency will be hosting State Senator Beal uh, in a visit that he requested to come to Bell coming to the uh, agency on September 29th. As part of that, we will have a luncheon at noon that day, and I will get each of you the information about that as all of the board members are invited to uh, attend that event with us. Uh, we'll be giving him a, a tour of the facilities uh, as well as the luncheon. The new committee structure, which was approved by the board, goes into effect today, so the information has been distributed to all of the board members on the new committees, committee assignments, and the scheduling is ongoing for those, and you'll start to see the new agenda packages for that. So uh, we'll pay close attention to make sure that everybody's calendars, everything gets right on those as we implement a new, new system. Uh, there's an event that will be coming up uh, September 24th, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. Uh, we will be participating in that event and I will get the information to board members should they uh, desire to attend that event as well. Uh, Assembly Bill 516, which was the temporary license plate bill, uh, was really on a good path as we've reported to you and both in committee and to the full boards. Uh, however, it hit a uh, brick wall this week and the governor's office uh, went into action and basically killed that bell bill for this year, uh, citing the DMV workload as well as concern over the increase in the fee ceiling that was included in that bill in order to allow the auto dealers to help cover their costs of implementing the temporary license plate <coughs> bill. Uh, we, we shall be undeterred in terms of uh, attempting again in the next session. Uh, you know, CTOC, the California Toll Operators uh, Committee is very involved in that as well. So we will continue to get to the bottom of what, what caused it to sort of die this year and uh, where we thought we had made it through in order to be able to push that you know critical legislation through which will benefit this agency greatly. Uh, Samuel Johnson, Chief Toll Ops, and I were able to attend the IBTTA annual conference. Uh, we had a great opportunity to work with our colleagues uh, in terms of discussing best practices related to customer service, uh, interoperability, national interoperability, which is progressing as well as uh, working with the vendors and other participants to really understand the toll technology advances in the industry. So uh, I will be putting together a more complete uh, summary of what we learned there and get that out to each of you as well. Uh, so one last item under direct report, I would like to ask uh, Samuel to basically give you an update on the violation notice issue that I had forwarded to you last week. 
All right, good morning. Um, as was noted in Mr. Kramen's email to you on Friday, we did experience a processing error that affected the notices to first time violators who are eligible for waiver of the violation penalty. The error was related to the design and processing of system tasks which run as part of our overall violation process. Uh, not to get too much into the technical weeds, but there, there are three key tasks that run as part of this process. And while the tasks are dependent on one another, we need step one to complete before step two and so on, um, the system design has them set up independently and that the, the dependency was achieved through the schedule. So task one would run at 8 a.m. and you know it should be done by 10 and then we start task two and so on. Uh, unfortunately, the, the first task uh, during this time period took longer to run than expected and the third task kicked off as scheduled like it should have. Unfortunately, this overlap in the processes resulted in some uh, 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 violation notices not being sent to uh, people who were eligible for the waiver of the penalty. The, this affected about 64,000 violation accounts and these accounts didn't receive the first notice um, that was scheduled to be sent. However, after 30 days in the system, um, the, the waiver expires, the penalty is reinstated, and then it's escalated. That portion did happen, which generated the second notice, which was sent, which unfortunately a lot of the customers, the first notice they got was the second one saying, you are a $100 penalty on top of the toll. Uh, so of course, people weren't very happy about that. And while we uh, hear that quite frequently in customer service, when people call regarding violations, uh, one of the common things we hear all the time is, well, I never got your mail. However, during this time, we saw a significant increase in the number of people who were citing that, and that triggered us to do more research, and that's when we were able to look into the system and find that this error occurred, because the computer system, it thinks everything ran fine and it completed. All the tasks did complete, but the order in which they completed is what caused the challenge. So we did immediately correct the system. Uh, we have isolated this issue, and we put in some checks and balances to monitor, this, monitor it so we don't run into this situation again. Um, we did immediately correct all those accounts and waived all the penalties and put them back to the status where those customers can just pay only the toll portion due. And we are sending letters to all of those customers, about 64,000, um, letting them know of this. And we did have about 5,000 customers who already went online and paid the full penalty. We are processing refunds for those customers. Uh, the credit card refunds, the letters will start going out today. The credit card refunds should be done in about a week and the check refunds will occur subsequent to that. The check refunds take a little more time because it's a manual effort because the law says we have to issue the refund for the check to the issuer of the check, which may be different than the account holder. So we actually have to look at each physical check we receive and see and determine who the refund will go to. So that's why that process is taking a little longer. So um, uh, the first time violator waiver program is an important part of customer service. So this was a very um, unfortunate error, but our ability to honor the program to the folks that were affected, our immediate issuance of the refunds and our notice, our mailing notice to these customers should help offset some of the customer inconvenience. We will keep the board informed of the status of this effort uh, and if any new findings should arrive. Uh, available for any questions. If you very good. Any questions? I do. Yes. Uh, in your comments, you mentioned when people call in. I'm still getting a lot of complaints from my constituents. It takes so long, the wait time. Uh, where are we on that? The, the last email I got was 45 minute wait. Uh, is, is that being resolved at all? So our average wait times, and this is a big discussion we want to have with the board at the upcoming um, toll operations workshop about what do we want our performance target to be. Um, our wait times have grown because the volume of calls have grown. So over the summer months, which is kind of our high period tourist uh, season, we were getting in um, the area of 50 to 70,000 calls a week, where in other months uh, prior, uh, I think in, um, it's, uh, in like April, May, and June, we were about 35,000 calls a month. So that big bump has kind of, I will say, put another roadblock in our efforts. So we are pretty much at the full staffing. The board is authorized. We're trying to fill other, uh, a few other key positions. We're also making better use of our San Clemente office. So we're getting the people that you've approved on board, but keeping up with the call volume has proven to be a challenge. But we're working on that and looking at ways we can reduce those call volumes 
handle calls um, in a shorter amount of time and be able to keep up with the volume that way. So that will be a big discussion at, at the workshop. Thank you. How much of the volume do you attribute to the computer glitch that we have? We think it's a small amount. Um, uh, <coughs> We think it's very small, but the bulk of the calls we do receive are still related to violations. So this was just one piece in this huge volume of, of calls we deal with. Okay, well I think you've heard it before and I'm gonna to come to Director Craig next, but uh, it's important to the board, as we've articulated, that a 50 minute, 45 minute wait time is not acceptable customer service for us. I'm glad that you're working on it. Um, I, I know some of the directors have asked about a call back system. Do we have that installed yet? We are in the process in the final stages of putting that in place. In fact, I think it was supposed to go in place uh, this week, but the, the, the error has taken priority, so we had to put that on the back corner, but we're very close to putting that in, putting that in place. Right. Thank you. Director Green. That was my question about the call back, because that was something that I recognized. Um, Director Spitzer's whisper in my ear. Why don't we? <laughs> oh, he's talking to himself. <laughs> he was suggesting why don't we send it overseas for the callbacks and for the complaints? That is definitely part of our procurement um, that we're going to go through, that we're going to be releasing here very soon in the next few weeks. And we are requiring that the contractor give us overflow capability so that when we have odd spikes, that there is another location that can absorb <laughs> those volume of calls without us having to pay for staff to sit around when we don't have the calls. Great, thank you. Did I answer your question? All right, thank you very much. No. Please, Sam, don't invite me. Don't invite <laughs> we, we appreciate the comments. Uh, Mr. Craven, any other comments on your report? No, sir. Okay. Uh, moving then to the director's reports. Uh, directors, in the last meeting, the ad hoc committee, because of a press for time, the ad hoc committee reports were postponed and Mr. Kramer said they would send them to the directors. That's actually in line with the streamlining that will be, take place next month where it will be part of your packets. So with your permission, I'd like to actually forego the uh, ad hoc committee verbal reports if Mr. Kramer's willing to send them to the directors with your permission. Any opposition to that? Yes. Seeing no opposition, why don't we go to direct reports? Any comments or questions the directors wish to articulate? <clears throat> Seeing none, I will uh, ask for a closed session. Mr. Joseph, no closed session. Nothing up. And I received a motion to adjourn by Director Kring. Second. Waiting for a second. And Director Puckett won that bid. So all in favor say aye. 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 Have a wonderfully thoughtful September 11th tomorrow and then a good weekend following. Thank you.